In medieval Europe, despite the prevailing view of the isolation, sainthood and sinlessness of monastic laymen and monks, things often did not look so good and graceful. As the official versions tell us, there was nothing quite like it for monks, and much less for monastic leadership. Bearing in mind that in those days monasteries were not only places of service to God, but also sufficiently wealthy establishments in modern parlance, money were running around. This is why the Holy Fathers often tried not to be sparing in their pleasures either. The topic of this episode is forbidden amusements of Holy Fathers in medieval Europe. You're watching Flip Side of History. Our arms are exhausted. It was probably the most harmless and even hilarious amusement for those monks who were rewriting church books. A monk could rewrite about five or six pages a day. In fact, this work was quite complex, monotonous, and demanded a lot of concentration on details. After all, each letter was drawn out separately. Plus, it was necessary to make sure it was correct and matched to the original. Likewise, sitting all day curled up was no easy task at all. So it is not a surprise that the writing monks came up with an unofficial way to amuse themselves. Naturally, it was not officially encouraged, but unofficially the entertainment flourished among all pinmen. Today, there is even a name for it – drollery. That is, the art of writing in the fields. You see, the borders were not considered a valuable part of the sheet, so the monks did what they wished to their hearts. Some wrote pitiful things like, my hands are tired, I want to sleep, and the similar. Others drew all kinds of creatures. For one instance, we know images of a kind of the mutant snail, a strange elephant, remotely resembling something between a tank and a quadcopter. Finally, the most preferred character of the penman for some reason was the rabbit. The rabbits in the fields were both good and evil, and they were both cannibals and warriors. Anyway, the clergy had only the best fun they could. By the way, some researchers assured that the world's first emoticon was invented by an unnamed monk. A similitude was found in the fields of one of the manuscripts. So basically, an officially unauthorized entertainment today has yielded many thousands of a fellow smiley face. Drunkenness and adulterous behavior If we pay attention to medieval carvings and paintings, we will notice that the ministers of the church were usually not of a shapely physique. Of course, this was not the case with pilgrims and the kind, but those who lived long enough in monasteries looked at least pretty well fed. And here a funny fact is of particular interest. The chief monk of the West, St. Benedict, expressly forbade monks to eat meat in his instructions, but the clever monk left a small gap. Meat was allowed to be eaten by those who were sick, so in the monasteries all the servants suffered incurable ailments while enjoying nicely cooked meat. And even far more interesting is that an average monk would eat almost a loaf and a half of bread per day. In those days it was an unheard of luxury. But the fact is that a loaf and a half is just in the calculation of the flour. And in fact, the monasteries had arranged very good bakeries who pampered their fellow brothers with excellent baked goods. Evidently, good pastry would make you overweight fast. And even the mandatory fasting did not have much effect on weight and physique, as an example of the spread of love for sweets and cakes, which is expressly forbidden by the church, we can give St. Francis, who on his deathbed was given almond cookies. This was the final wish of the religious person. Along with a certain amount of lack of restraint and eating in the monasteries went side by side with a lot of lack of restraint in drinking alcoholic beverages. If beer was considered a substitute for water in those days, then wine drinking, if you look at folk tales, at least one joke out of four in a religious topic will be about the drunkenness of church officials. And the magnitude of the phenomenon reached such a scale that special guidelines had been issued in which the punishment to be inflicted on a clergyman found guilty of abusing wine was outlined in detail. But such instructions did not help them much. The drunken holy fathers were so accomplished in this matter that history has not forgotten their so-called feats even today. Just a couple of typical cases. Cautine of Tours, bishop, according to the accounts of his contemporaries, so drunk with wine that only four men could carry him away from the table. But his colleague was beaten by the bishop of Soissons, holy father. For nearly four years he was in a condition of permanent drunkenness. To ensure that the king did not insensibly execute a drinker when his majesty's escort was passing through town, his subordinates locked the bishop in a cell so that he would not do anything while drunk. Substitution and Corruption It is entertainment as well as a way of life. It is no secret that in many monasteries the leadership has engaged in both simple money laundering and the illegal sale of monastic lands, and that the proceeds have gone far beyond the needs of the church. For instance, the case of Prior John Fox, who was first accused of adultery with a married woman and then of being corrupt, was preserved. But the punishment was quite mild. Fox was just deprived of his rank and no one appears to have asked where the funds from the monastery lands sold went. Indulgence and such 
In general, in the Middle Ages, convents were directly the center of sexual progress, and this was indeed often true. Especially frequent was the relationship between churchmen and nuns. From the clergyman's point of view, a nun is the bride of Christ, and in loving Christ, one unintentionally falls in love with a nun as well. It is also true that often the punishment for such a thing was quite severe. In the 12th century, in one monastery, it was found that a clergyman had been having an affair with a nun. At the request of the abbess, the cleric castrated himself, and the product cut off for some reason was put in the mouth of the sinful nun. But for the sake of fairness, it would be fair to say that such cases were certainly not frequent. On the opposite, many of the higher ranks of the church entertained themselves to the fullest. Bishop Lepswet reported that a veritable sect of heretical religious ministers had appeared, and that they practiced a very strange kind of intimacy. According to him, the meetings took place in a secret cave, where the highest, in that place church official inserted, you already gassed where, a silver spoon, and then all the present kissed the spoon, after which an enormous orgy began to be made up. And if the issue of the spoon may well have been invented by the bishop himself, as for the orgies which were often combined with overtly pagan rituals, there is considerable evidence preserved in history. Here is what Guillaume Pepin wrote. Many unreformed worshippers, including even ordained ministers, used to enter non-reformed nunneries and indulge in wild dances and orgies with the nuns, day and night. And there were actually many things to offend devout minds. It was outright pagan rituals. Behind these strong monastic walls, the brothers and sisters indulged in such outright debauchery that it could be compared to an elementary Sabbath. The rituals and actions that took place were not only disapproved of, but even flatly condemned by the church. But the church servants themselves sometimes went off to such an extent that they simply died unable to endure the emotional impact. The monastic men of the male monasteries then danced with the nuns of the neighboring female monasteries, and the bishops joined in their festivities. The Erfurt Chronicle even describes how one church dignitary indulged in such exorcisms that he died of a rush of blood to the head. In medieval England, there were many accusations against nuns who willingly or unwillingly indulged in fleshly pleasures not only with their brethren, but also with the locals. But to be fair, it must be said that the male half of the monastery did not go far in terms of observing church rules. Thus, in 1531, one monk, John Slyhurst, was accused of indecency. During the investigation, which was conducted by the bishop himself, it turned out that the monk in question had been caught doing the same thing before. In 1531, a representative of the bishop visited the abbey. During that visit, he learned that the monk was accused of molestation by name. The victim had told his mother about it. It also turned out that the monk had been caught doing the same thing before. The offender was convicted rather strangely. It was strictly banned to let boys into his cell. But where there are such cases, of course, there can be no such thing as same-sex love. Officially, monks were punished for such things, and altogether officially, there could be no such a thing. But the fact is that history has conserved the so-called books of repentance, which clearly and in detail examined how a monk could atone for this or that sin. These three books were named the Book of Finian, the Book of Columbanus, and the Book of Comian. And what is most interesting is that they consider the penalties for specific crimes exclusively within the framework of same-sex love. The books include the phrase, if it has become a habit. In the case of habit, the punishment was increased manyfold. Those who satisfy their desires through the lips do penance for three years. If it is habitual, then seven. Columbanus requires that a monk who has committed the sin of sodomy must do penance for ten years. In essence, the penalties for indirect contact were quite light ranging from 5 to 100 days of fasting, depending on the author of the book. And here it is interesting that King Edward I of England introduced the death penalty for this in 1317. But in a period of 400 years, there have been only 73 such trials. That is, strange as it may seem, the attitude at the time was somewhat tolerant. Thank you for watching our episode. Do not hesitate to subscribe, also leave a like and watch other episodes on Flip Side of History.